Welcome back to the Quantum Science Seminar. This is episode nine. And today we're going to have uh, Jun Yi, who will talk about polar molecules. Uh, remember, you're very welcome to ask questions. Um, please send those questions to us via email to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com or uh, ask them in the YouTube live chat at the bottom of the window on your right. Uh, also, June agreed to take a break in the middle of his talk, where we will start to answer some of the questions, then the rest of your questions will answer at the end of the talk. And don't worry, if there's more questions as usual, then we can answer. We will also provide something in written form on the website. Please also note that there's a 30 second time delay between uh, what we see and what you see. So uh, take that into account in your questions. And uh, with that, I... Um, actually have myself the honor today of introducing our speaker. Today we have Jun Ye from JILA, which is a joint institute between the University of Colorado and the National Institute of Standards and Technology in Boulder, Colorado. Jun studied physics at the Jiao Tong University in Shanghai and then went to the US uh, to do a master's in theoretical quantum optics with Marlon Scully at the University of, of New Mexico. But then he decided to go into experimental physics and joined uh, Jan Hall's lab at JILA, which has been the leading lab worldwide for um, lasers and precision spectroscopy for, well, about the last 50 years. During uh, Jun's PhD work, Jun, Jan, and uh, Ma Long Sheng pioneered a variety of uh, laser spectroscopy and precision measurements techniques that are uh, in wide use today throughout uh, our community. And in 1997, June uh, joined uh, Jeff Kimball's group at Caltech to work on yet another thing, namely trapping single atoms in high quality optical cavities. Then he came back to Jilla in 1999 and started to take, to take over uh, Jan's lab. Uh, together, they worked on the, the new optical fiber technology that enabled the octave spanning optical frequency comb, which made absolute frequency measurements across the visible spectrum feasible for the first time. Um, I have to confess that I had some trouble coming up with this introduction because there's uh, simply too much stuff going on in June's lab. June's also my PhD advisor, and I had the great fortune to work with him from 2004 and to uh, 2011, roughly. And I just remembered that one of my colleagues back then said something that stuck with me. So basically, he said, uh, besides his enthusiasm for science, uh, um, what he admired most about June is that June can claim to be a world-recognized expert in all three of atomic, molecular, and optical physics. For today's seminar, for example, June could have talked about optical lattice clocks, direct laser cooling of molecules, lasers with millihertz line widths, frequency combs ranging from the extreme ultraviolet to the mid-infrared, or any of the many uh, collaborations he's involved in. But instead today, he'll tell us about an experiment that he co-supervised with Debbie Jin, which has now led to the first quantum degenerate Fermi gas of polar molecules. June, thanks for agreeing to speak today. I am looking forward to hearing what's new in the lab. Fine. Uh, oh, thank you, Sebastian. Am I, my voice is good now. Okay. Uh, thank you for the very kind introduction. And I want to thank the committee for organizing this virtual seminar that keeping the international scientific community together. This is a rather important and a very appreciative. Um, uh, giving me this opportunity to come here to present some of the new results um, for me guess of polar molecules now moving towards in the 2D, two-dimensional uh, optical trance. So some of the data are actually very new. Uh, Colorado has been opened in the phase one episode. Uh, we have been re-entering the labs with one or two students per experiment uh, at one time. So it's, but ironically, you know, students are just incredible. Uh, the experiments uh, have been built with actually more robust experimental control. So data actually rolling in, in a fairly quiet building of Jella. Usually it's bustling, but during the daytime, we still can take a very beautiful experimental data. So that's the positive out of the uh, unfortunate situation since uh, since March, since January, I would say, uh, worldwide. But, but that's... Uh, Maybe I'll share some with some of you most recent data that's quite exciting. Uh, really, really seems like uh, some of the dreams we have had for polar molecules for two decades now uh, are coming to fruition. So here the picture that showed on the front shows that three-dimensional Fermi degenerate gas that we can load into pancakes in a, in a stack of pancakes of 2D traps that's shown to the left with, with under the electrical field. And in the bottom right, 
uh, here it's a picture of uh, that we took on these individual pancakes of molecules, how uh, the dynamics of individual pancakes is being influenced by the temperature, by the electric field, and so on. So let me just give you a quick, of a, uh, quick review before I go on to talk about the most recent results. Uh, dipolar quantum systems, you know, this is something we have dreamed about. It's particularly the right-hand side. At one point, back, uh, maybe 15 years ago, theorists uh, have been proposing ideas where you can study not only dynamics of individual 2D traps of these molecules confined to them, but potentially when the thermal energy, the kinetic energy is so low, you can actually see the emergence of the pairing between different pancakes of molecules located on different pancakes, such that you can have a composite particles being, being formed uh, and order can start to emerge from disorder, from disconnected Fermi C's of these molecules. And, uh, and it, it gave rise to new interesting long, long strong correlations in a quantum system. So uh, the, the reason why we are interested in dipolar systems is because they provide tunable long range interactions. And this is a new, new systems that we can use for quantum information processing for quantum metrology and, it, and it, to some degree allow you to study chemistry, uh, chemical reactions in this uh, uh, quantum regime. And, but of course we know there are many pioneering experiments already in the field using atomic magnetic dipoles. Um, so what's the difference between electrical, molecular electrical dipoles and molecular atomic magnetic dipoles? The difference being one is the magnitude. Of course, if you compare a natural unit of a ball magneton versus a Debye worth of electrical dipole, the interaction energy difference is 10 to the four. But of course, uh, in, the, in the atomic physics community, uh, pioneers have been using uh, atoms with larger magnetic moments. For example, if you have 10 uh, ball magneton, then of course, immediately, the interaction energy of magnetic dipole interaction goes up by factor of 100. Uh, still, electrical dipole interactions is stronger. And I think one of the most unique aspect of electrical field dipole moment is you can tune it. Not only the angle, not only the orientation of the dipole, but strength of it by just changing the electrical field. And so some of that, those features of by tuning the electrical field, we can tune the interactions and tune the interaction dynamics and so on. I will start to sh will show them in the second half of my talk. And of course, molecules are complex, uh, as Sebastian mentioned, that this was a collaboration that Debbie and I started back in 2004, in fact, a long, long time ago. And I understand that Kang Kun also gave a talk in the seminar series. Kang Kun was one of the uh, uh, very first uh, second graduate student working in the, in, on those experiments. The molecules are complex, going from thermal all the way to quantum degeneracy. There are many degrees of freedom you need to control uh, in the internal and external degrees of freedom and often spans many orders of magnitude in energy landscape. But the most important part is you have to get all the entropies out of all these various different degrees of freedom so that finally you can create molecules of identical quantum state, many of them, uh, so that you can get a quantum degeneracy. June, and can I, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. We're not seeing your slides change. I'm hoping that's a bug. You're not seeing my slides moving forward? Yes, correct. We're still seeing the title slide. Oh. That's, that's not good. <laughs> Maybe just restart the... Okay, um, maybe I stop sharing and let's restart sharing. Sure, sounds good. Do, or do you see the slides now, the whole deck? Uh, nope, not yet. Okay. Now we're seeing him. Do you see the um, slide? Yes. Yes. And let me let me show um, animation. Do you see those? The animation I see. I see. Okay. Looks good. So sorry about that. I just went through, no uh, you know, um, magnetic moment versus, versus uh, electrical dipole moment, and emphasizing one being tunable in both angular and and, and the strength for the interactions. 
and the magnitude of the electrical dipole interaction in general cases is, is a quite a bit larger than the magnetic dipole interactions. And I just mentioned about molecule, molecules being complex in, in order to create quantum gas of molecules takes a lot of effort, particularly not necessarily the energy landscape, but uh, getting all the um, entropy out of these various different degrees of freedom from both internal and external degrees of freedom has been challenging. And I have must mention that the laser cooling of molecules has been very successful actually recently in the field. We can cool molecules now with just lasers down to uh, a few microcalvin. But the experiment I'm going to show you today relies on the fact that we can create ultra cold atoms. The slides are still good, right, Sebastian? Yeah. Um, so in this particular case, that was the example that we demonstrated back in 2008. You can create a Fermi degenerate gas of potassium 40 and along with a BEC of aluminum 87. And bring these two species together, you can create uh, through coherent state transfer, first through flashback resonance used through the magnetic field, and using a pair of Raman lasers to do adiabatic optical state transfer, you can create a KIB molecules in the ground state with intrinsic dipole moment of a 0.5 Dubai. And uh, this number that I quoted at the bottom left, temperature of 200 nanokelvin, around that temperature, a few hundreds of nanokelvin density, about 10 to the 12 per cc, and in, because this is a Fermi Bohr's mixture, so it creates a fermionic molecules and with a temperature of T of a TF of 1.4. That was more or less the state of the art um, up to just a few years ago, two years ago, as that number stayed for a long time. Except in the community, of course, there are many, many other labs now can create different mixtures of bioalkali atoms. And some of the labs I've listed in the, in the top of the list. And I think new experiments are still coming up. So if uh, if your institute's name is not included here, I apologize. Uh, um, so these techniques have been fairly successful in creating bioalkali molecules, some of which can have a very large dipole moment, and you know, three Dubai and so on. Uh, the KIB is in fact the weakest dipole moment. Uh, and uh, here's a joke, Peter, Peter Zola comes to, to our lab visiting, visit often, and he often comes, every time he comes to visit, he always has new ideas. <laughs> and sometimes the new ideas is so exciting. And uh, we were discussing this and he, he would say, well, it's just too bad. Your KIB molecules has such a low dipole moment. Uh, and so, so we took that comment and we actually magnified it into a, you know, put a Peter's portrait on, in our laboratory with this words, too bad, the KIB has such a low dipole moment. And I quoted it in front of <laughs> hanging in, in the lab as a stimulation, as inspiration for us to catch up. You know, the dipole moment is weak. Let's put a lot of molecules in there. So just to reveal a little bit of since the creation of these KIB molecules in the quantum regime, the first thing we studied is actually chemi chemistry that because those molecules don't, don't live long, they somehow get lost. And in fact, Kang Kun Ni's group uh, she reported uh, uh, very recently that she cannot understand why these molecules get lost because they have they're creating intermediates and the intermediate get dissociated away and, and so on. But so the early days when we were studying these, the KIB is a fermion, so they, they come together and the zero, uh, the first order partial waves, uh, so-called S wave interaction is forbidden due to the anti-symmetrization of the fermionic wave functions of the two particles. So you have the P wave uh, is the first uh, low threshold, uh, low uh, partial wave interaction. And associated with the P wave, there's a P wave barrier. And you can actually use this very simple picture to study the molecular reaction in this quantum regime, where quantum statistics and a single partial waves at a threshold dominate the lost mechanisms you see. When you apply electrical field, what you typically see in the three-dimensional gas of molecules, the dipolar interaction enhances the reaction because the attractive part of the dipolar interaction lower the barrier of the P wave. And so one way to suppress that is by confining these molecules in two dimensions. And so in, as uh, almost nine years ago, we were able to show, yes, you know, um, compared to the three-dimensional optical traps, in, if you confine molecules in 2D, you can keep that reaction loss rate not blowing up you know, and, and keep it steady instead of going up as a function of a dipole moment raised to the power of six in three dimensions. So some, this is some of the, the basic understanding of the loss mechanism. 
And then we went ahead uh, in, the, in the ensuing years by just confining these molecules in three-dimensional optical lattice. And the reason for doing, doing so is very simple because you can protect these molecules from having chemical reactions with, with respect to each other. And for example, here shows a lifetime of 25 seconds or so in an optical lattice. And the reason, of course, is very simple. When these identical Fermi molecules, you have a poly exclusion principle preventing them from jumping onto each other if you, you are in the lowest um, identical and the lowest uh, vibrational band uh, in the lattice. Another, another mechanism at work is even if these molecules are not identical, for example, you flip one of the nuclear uh, states of one of these molecules to make them uh, non-identical, nevertheless, the interaction, which can both be imaginary and, and, it, and uh, um, real, meaning they have uh, on-site interactions, elastic and inelastic interactions, that interaction will block uh, the tunneling process, the so-called quantum Zeno effect. So these molecules can live there in 3D. But you, 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 then you will say, well, well, how do you turn this into an interesting quantum antibody system? Well, they have, after all, you have these dipole moments. And, and so you can encode a rotation, for example, as your qubit, as your spin. And, and the, the two spin states have opposite parity and supports a, a full matrix of a dipole moment. And in the KIB case, it's a 0.55 divide. And, and you can put these molecules in optical lattices with, with electrical field or not, or you can use both DC or AC electrical field. And you can turn on this dipole-dipole interaction and writing this full spin Hamiltonian that I've shown on the upper right of the, of the screen. And so if you look at it, there's a geometrical factor in front of it, VDD, that, that's the dipolar interaction that cares about the, ang uh, the angle between the dipoles and the distance between these dipoles. There's a so-called Ising term that when the, the two dipoles are pointing to the, in the same directions, you can have a Ising interactions. You can also have spin exchange interactions between dipoles. And the energy scale on these dipolar interactions with typical lattice, for example, around 500, 600 nanometers or so, you know, created by one micron lasers, uh, with the KIB's dipole moment of a 0.55 divide, uh, it, it's about 100 hertz or so uh, between neighboring sites. So reasonable, be good interaction energy. If you have a full control of both DC and AC electrical field, then in principle, you can study this full spin kind of Hamiltonian and tuning the relative interaction strengths between Ising and spin exchange in the three-dimensional space. So, so that's a really interesting aspect. And in fact, early on, uh, back in 2013, we realized this dipolar spin lattice model. You can, you can confine these dipoles in the optical lattice. And I just realized that uh, my mouse is not a laser pointer, but rather a white arrow. Maybe at this point, I will just move on because I worry about going to the laser pointer in my freeze the screen again. Um, so so you, you can see these molecules being confined in this op three-dimensional optical lattice. And, it's, and if you want to encode the, the, the qubits of these individual type molecules in their rotational degrees of freedom, all you need is to turn on a microwave field to drive this into a coherent spin superposition between the two rotational states, the, the ground and the first rotational excited state. And in this, in this rotating uh, frame, uh, the dipoles, of course, is fully realized in, per molecule. And so the molecules located in neighboring or next neighboring sites can have a spin exchange uh, described by the, the Hamiltonian that I showed earlier in the previous slide. So if you wait for a little while and probe the system response, you can actually do this very normal so-called Ramsey spectroscopy with a certain variation of coherence time t, evolution time t. And you will see the contrast of the Ramsey fringe decays away and it has also oscillatory behavior. And this oscillatory behavior can actually be understood. You can do Fourier transform of this contrast decay. And it, figuring out this interaction energy that I've shown as a schematic where the green molecule in the center can experience dipolar interactions with its neighboring dipoles with their magnitude and the sign indicated of individual uh, molecules around this green ball of the molecule. And as the, dipole, as the molecule uh, filling in the lattice in, is increased, you can see the decay curve gets stronger and stronger, but you still can see this visible 
uh, interactions between neighboring and next, 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 next neighbor interactions between those dipole exchange interactions. But at that time, and in fact, the fact that you, uh, you can still see very clearly these oscillatory behaviors because it is, is actually, in fact, telling you an indication of uh, the filling is not very good. The, the filling in the 3D lattice at the time when we did this experiment was only about 5%. So, so we went on try to improve that filling. We would like to go to uh, four quantum degenerate Fermi systems that can fill in optical lattice, just like we do it with atomic Fermi gas. And in doing so, uh, we take a, a new approach where instead of creating molecules in, in three-dimensional optical dipole traps, we start to create molecules by having first uh, creating first two insulators, for rubidium mod insulator and potassium fermionic band insulator, and then co-locate them on the same optical lattice. Then we do magnetic association and steer up this optical transfer, coherent optical transfer process, with, where we use interactions between rubidium and potassium, we can pre-engage uh, one atomic species each per lattice site. So, that, so once you have one potassium atom, one rubidium atom in a particular lattice site, the conversion process of uh, magnetic association and steer up is actually almost 100% efficient. So the, the, the technical challenges was actually how to create these dual insulators and overlap them really well on the, on the optical lattice. No, and the, with, with the conflicting requirements where the rubidium is bosons like to converge on top of each other while potassium the fermions like to, uh, you need to ha have very strong external confinement to push the fermions towards the center and then rubidium becomes multi-layered. So, so those are the technical challenges in, in doing this quantum synthesis of molecules by using this dual, dual insulator approach. But nevertheless, we made a progress. <coughs> we created mo KRB molecules with um, about 25% filling, significant improvement over the previous techniques. But the number of molecules we created is very low, about 1,000 molecules. Still, the filling, we think we can uh, continue to improve on this using this approach. 50% was what we calculated to be completely doable. But we are, we are not sure if this can get you into the, in the full degenerate regime. Um, and I want to mention this was also the last experiment that we did um, with Debbie before she passed away, unfortunately, in 2016. But when she was sick, um, we, we were already redesigning a new system. And so now the, all the results I'm going to show you from this point on is coming from the, the second generation Jelly KIB machine. The key differences here is that the electrodes are made all inside the vacuum. And you can see this glass cell uh, with lots of optical access, but you can see this transparent electrical electrodes um, this tie all coated um, glass plates are inside. And it, there's also rods that's, um, uh, that's uh, also inside, tungsten rods. And it turns out these capabilities is, uh, are critical for the next phase of in, in, uh, improvement in the molecular quantum gas experiments. So the fact that all electrodes are in vacuum, meaning we can actually apply in a very large electrical field, something much more than we were able to do so when the electrodes were outside, because the glass gets polarized and so on. So we can get to fields as high as a 15, 20 kilovolts per centimeter um, with the controllable gradients applied in various different directions. And I will show you why the controlling the gradients of electrical field is also important, because you can use this to deform your traps, to, for evaporative cooling and so on. And we also have a lot of optical access to where you can um, have all kinds of optical lattice and dipole trap combinations as well as a high resolution imaging. It's not single site, but, but it, as you can see, some of the imaging techniques we use already is sufficient for us to see layer by layer of these molecular distributions. And this is just uh, some cat drawing of, uh, of the system. So the first success came a, a couple of years later. This was a paper we published early last year, uh, demonstrating for the first time making a degenerate Fermi gas of the molecules. The key advance here, I must say, is basically by making 
both rubidium and potassium deeply degenerate. And, and immediately we were able to enhance the, create, the, the, the conversion efficiency of KIV molecules from both atomic species shown here as one is false Einstein condensate and the other one thermally degenerate gas. And through this Feshbach resonance uh, to create a Feshbach molecules and then use this uh, loosely bound Feshbach molecules to do state by single state quantum state transfer using a pair of a coherent Raman lasers we can create a Fermi gas of a KIB molecules. So we tried it with various different combinations of a degeneracy uh, ranging from in early days, the T over TF of a uh, K, uh, potassium atom usually is around 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So it's barely degenerate. But here you can see we were able to take that degeneracy down fairly low to T over TF of 0.1 and the BEC T over TC for rubidium it ranges from uh, 0.9 to 0.5. And correspondingly, we can create uh, the KIV degeneracy, degenerative Fermi gas of a KIV molecules with the role with the TLTF TF around 0.3 or so. And what's really interesting is that we can create actually 10 to the five molecules in, in this regime. Uh, the, for the lowest TLTF, TF, it still has like 30,000 molecules there. So it's a large ensemble of molecules. To show you this whole creation process is fully thermalized, um, you can do a several tests. Oh, the, the first one, for example, you created this KRB Feshbach molecules, KRB star. And, and since uh, potassium is typically a majority because it's a, we want to have lots of fermions around since the fermions have larger entropy. So we want to create very large Fermi C where the BEC is sitting at the bottom of that Fermi C and they take the the coldest part, the most dense part of the potassium to pair up with the rubidium to make the KIB molecules. So after the KIB um, Feshbach molecules is produced, you can remove the remaining rubidium. Actually, most of the rubidium is actually converted. Conversion efficiency is extremely high. Uh, but nevertheless, you can remove some of the background rubidium. And uh, the, uh, the KIB star, the, the Feshbach molecule, uh, it does not react very quickly with the potassium atom. So you can actually leave the potassium around and watch them thermalize. Uh, and for example, you can excite center of mass oscillation of the Feshbach KIB and keep potassium as cold as, as you previously created the, the degeneracy of the Fermi gas of the potassium. And as you increase the potassium density, uh, you can see the oscillation of the KRB molecules gets dampened fairly quickly as you increase the potassium density. And from those collisional physics, uh, you can measure the scattering length of uh, potassium atoms and the uh, Feshbach KRB molecules. And we found that basically follows the, the, the cross-section of the potassium with rubidium, which, which is understandable. This is a, a very large uh, Feshbach molecule. So, what dictates this collisional cross-section uh, between KIV, Feshbach, and potassium is mostly just rubidium and the potassium interactions. The next, you can actually directly study the Feshbach uh, creation process by varying the so-called ramp speed. The bottom axis shown here, Feshbach ramp rate, is how fast you are, we are ramping the magnetic field across the Feshbach resonance. And in a typical scale, time scale we use, for example, the ramp is typically at a millisecond, we ramp a magnetic field about two gauss or so. In that process, we, as you ramp across the Feshbach resonance, we typically have a six or so elastic collisions. And that's sufficient to thermalize the whole gas. And the picture here shows uh, very clearly, uh, as you vary the Feshbach ramp rate, you can actually probe elastic versus inelastic process. For example, if your ramp time is too fast, it was too slow, excuse me. Um, and, and, and as showing in the, in the left-hand side of the, uh, the bottom axis where the Feshbach ramp rate is, is uh, very, very small, this, this, then you create a molecules with a fairly large T of a TF because it's dominated by inelastic loss in your resonance. If you, on the other hand, ramp too fast, then it, the, the gas doesn't have a, a chance to really fully thermalize with atomic gas and you also do not create a very low TLTF. It's only just right about a few gas per centimeter, one or so gas per, per millisecond, excuse me. That's the Goldilocks place where the, uh, the lowest temperature TLTF is reached around 0.3. So once you 
you can also use the so-called fluctuation of density uh, suppression in Fermi gas to characterize how deeply degenerate the Fermi gas is. And this is a, a very well established technique from atomic gas experiments early on from both MIT and Zurich. Uh, we have recently done that in strontium uh, quantum gas as well. And you, you can see here if this uh, Fermi C uh, distribution of the, of the molecules. Uh, and of course, in comparison to high fluctuation area near the trap uh, edge, you will see more uh, fluctuations because the gas is more towards a classical regime. But in the middle of the Fermi C, when it's a deeply degenerate, you'll have a very low density fluctuations. And you can directly visualize this by taking images of the KIB molecules and remove the, the mean value of the, of the molecular number throughout the crowd and then look at the variance of the density fluctuations. And you can clearly see the variance gets uh, suppressed in the middle and it shows that if the, if the gas is thermal, uh, the variance equals to the mean number. But when you get into the de Fermi degeneracy, as you go to towards the center of the trap, as the mean number increases, then the, the variance of the density fluctuation goes down. It's suppressed. One last thing I want to talk about before getting to the 2D is that, remember 10 years ago, we studied this chemistry new absolute zero. And we, at that time we plotted for P wave threshold behavior, essentially the, the so-called two, co two body uh, loss rate beta, the rate coefficient of the two body loss can be very well described linearly as a function of the temperature. And this is a very well supported by the MQDT theory um, multi-channel quantum defect theory that was developed by, by pioneered by Paul Julian. Uh, and it was, it was just amazing. Paul can write down a single line equation and more or less describes the rate of loss that we observe in this quantum regime. And, and it's, you can see the reasonably good agreement and actually more recent experiment from eight years later and you know, two years ago, uh, we showed actually much better agreement with Paul's MQDT theory essentially sits right on top of each other when the then temperature of the molecules is cooled lower and the condition is better controlled, I guess. And, and I want to point out, of course, Conquin's uh, group recently were able to have a direct detection of the K2-RB2 intermediate. And that really shows a microscopic picture of what's going on of this biomolecular reaction process. <laughs> a surprising finding was that when we bring this quantum gas, uh, bring this uh, um, uh, KIB gas into quantum degeneracy, if you plot this two body loss rate beta as divided by temperature T, if the beta is proportional to temperature, then of course you divide the temperature away, it should be a constant. And that's what the red points shown when the T of a TF of the gas is above degeneracy. But when you bring the uh, degeneracy into this quantum gas system, you will actually see the this rate uh, uh, normalized by temperature is now suppressed. And this is actually rather counterintuitive because it, it, for Fermi gas, you will say, well, if anything is by bringing temperature to zero, you still have finite energy left in your system. So if the P wave is caring about the relative energy between those, that, that means the, the loss rate should actually enhance and so this is something uh, uh, we are still trying to understand, but fortunately now there are two theory groups that have come up with some plausible models. One is a Chizos group in Purdue University has been working on the P wave contact in the regime that the, the loss is present. Um, and that's one way to explain this many body effects of the loss suppression in the P wave when the gas is brought into the quantum degeneracy. And then Maria Reis group has taken on a different approach using, using the fact that Conquin's group has seen the molecular complex and she, her group has come up with ideas of quantum Zeno effect of the reaction process using this microscopic picture of uh, intermediates. And this can give you a surprising counterintuitive uh, behavior of actually suppress the loss when, when, the, when you have too many molecules um, for, uh, concentrated in the center. And these are some of the measurements, like especially for example, P wave contact. In three dimensional gas, it's going to be difficult to measure because it's a rather weak and it's a loss dominated process, right? 
But we are very hopeful in 2D that I'm about to show you those results in 2D that we can shed light of this both elastic and elastic interactions, how they interact with each other and give rise to these many body effects. But, but this is sort of the summarize of the surprising finding that uh, when you're getting the, the molecules into t see there's some unexpected behavior that's going to show up here. So this maybe is a good midpoint. Uh, if uh, people have questions, we, I can entertain some of them before I move on to talk about 2D uh, system. Um, thank you, June. These are very nice results. We do have a few questions. Um, let me start with that. So Yaakov Yudkin is asking, what is the reason you choose to work with one boson and one fermion? Is it just because uh, these are favorable experiment, experimental properties for potassium and rubidium or is, it, or is there anything fundamental in choosing one of each? You know, sometimes it's, a, it's very easy to give that answer because I was working with the queen of the fermions. That's the answer. It's a, it's a Debbie. <laughs> Debbie said, why, you know, it's really interesting watching Debbie and Eric Cornell interact. Eric, uh, bosons, bosons, BEC, and Debbie was like, Eric, why is BEC interesting? Fermions are much more interesting. So it's, it's all Debbie's decision. If we want to make a polar molecules, let's study Fermi polar molecules. For, for a newcomer to I, the field, what would you suggest uh, to choose? And actually, you, um, it's a really interesting also, when we pick a KRB, it's not because of uh, any particular foresight, uh, you know, we calculated all the dipole moment. Remember that was back in 2004, there weren't many, uh, well, there was no molecules, uh, the bioapply molecules at the time. There was no big discussion about which molecule has bigger dipole moment. So it happens to be the KRB actually has the lowest dipole moment, 0.5. That's why Peter made that comment. It's the, it's the lowest among all the bioalkali species. But there are fantastic work as I listed in one of the, my slides that uh, there are work going on uh, everywhere now uh, across the world uh, about creating molecules with dipole moment that can be as large as a three, three and a four divide. Um, so, uh, but it's still, it, I think each system, once you get into a regime that that hasn't been realized before, you're, you're going to see surprises. So I actually think sometimes the overanalyzing and overthinking about which system is better, uh, it's all useful, but it's also useful to actually just get to the lab and actually make that happen. Mm -hmm. And you will, you will be able to take turn that into a, a nice playground. Thanks. So the other thing that people often mention is KIB is loss, lossy, you know, has a chemical reactions. And so we are going to pick a molecule so which does not have the so-called exosomic by uh, by by molecular loss. Mm -hmm. But it turns out in the experiment, everybody sees loss. And there's actually more complex behavior going on. So so the, the natural way to think about it is to okay, let's suppress this loss if possible. Mm -hmm. We have uh... Two questions actually from Bill Phillips. Uh, the first one, is the P-wave barrier to collisions of fermions any different in the way it protects against collision depending on whether these are uh, fermions, uh, these fermions are atoms or polar molecules? I think they are the same. The atoms usually don't have this so-called reactive loss. This is what Paul Julian uh, described as a black hole in the middle where you know, if there's a P-wave barrier, so if the molecules were able to penetrate through that P-wave barrier, once you get behind the P-wave barrier, in the molecular case, unfortunately, they will go on and proceed to the, the short range and they just get lost. There's a chemistry going on there. In the atom case, normally you don't have that process. And, and so, so the, the elastic collision will dominate. While in the molecular case, in the KIB case, the, the inelastic process dominate through that P wave. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So the second question, um, could you say more about why the decaying contrast of the superposition state, I, I guess he's referring to the uh, Ramsey experiment. Um, uh, why is it oscillating and why uh, these oscillations do not seem to decay? The, the, so that the decay is because there are many pairs of oscillations. Uh, you, can, you can imagine you know, a molecule in the middle and you can have a molecules coming from next neighbor, next, next neighbor, and their neighbors can be from 
upstairs, downstairs, diagonal, and the left-hand side, the right-hand side, they have different signs that have a different interaction energy. So if you add many of these different pairs of interaction energy, many of these oscillations together you lead to a decay. And the more of these interaction energy terms you add in, the faster the decay will become if you, if you have a higher, higher filling. And the, the, the reason one of the dominant term that, that you show the oscillation does not decay away is because then it turns out there's one, the, the uh, next neighbor interaction, which has happened to be right next door. And that interaction across uh, you know, four, four, four sites around you are all symmetric. And so that, that interaction just dominate. And so that interaction is actually, in fact, what you see as the most obvious, like mm -hmm. basically 100 Hertz interaction energy. And we can actually use the, NMR uh, has techniques like so-called a wakuha pulse. They can, you can apply seven pulses, like the dynamic decoupling sequence. You can actually de-entangle de and um, disentangle these two interacting molecules because after your spin exchange, they actually are fully entangled, but you can apply pulses to disentangle the, them and actually suppress these oscillations by using these seven pulse sequences and so on. So if Bill is interested, I can find a, a private channel to show him those. Perfect. So we have a few more questions, but I guess we should uh, uh, continue for now and then keep them for later. Thanks. Well, thank you. So, so now I'm going to go into the, all of this work I'm going to present to you now are, are, are very recent, including some of the ta data taken during that last three weeks of the phase one reopening. So this is just excellent, good spirit, uh, you know, in difficult times, you can still do something interesting, uh, interesting science. <coughs> the detailed design of this apparatus is actually described in Jake Colby's PhD thesis. Um, Jake has recently uh, finished his postdoc with Manuel Anders in Caltech. He's going to become a professor in Illinois. So the picture that I show to the left here, this is the, basically the six electrodes, the two parallel plates, and then four rods. And it, you will come to appreciate why we made the arrangement like this. And the, the basic um, numbers that I want to quote is that you can apply DC electrical field and tune that from zero to 15 kilovolts per centimeter. You can apply gradient field, zero to almost 10 kilovolts per centimeter square. They allow you to create curvatures in both X direction and the Y direction. Remember Z direction is along the axis here. And so, so along Z direction, we have no way of creating electrical field gradient and so on. But in the two transverse directions, X and Y, Y is along the gravity, X is a, is a parallel to the plate and a parallel to the two, the, those, uh, those uh, rods. That does, those two directions, we can control the electrical field. We can control the electrical field, also the orientation, the angle of theta. So the, and it, so at the same time, these four electrodes, rods, can also be used to carry I field to, flip, to, to drive rotational excitations in these molecules. So as, we, as I showed earlier, electrical field in 3D gas will increase the chemical reactivity because of a dipolar interactions. But in 2D, you can, you can use the two-dimensional confinement by creating dominantly repulsive dipolar interactions to increase the ratio of elastic over inelastic collisions. So this is the approach we are taking. And I have to say, we are just following many, many pioneering visions from mostly from my theory colleagues and some of the names, I'm sure it's not an exhaustive list, but, it, but you recognize many of those names, right? From Hans Peter to John Bone to Eugene Demler, Paul Julian, uh, Magic, uh, Louis Santos, Gerard Shrapnikov, who would forget him, uh, and, and Peter Zoller, uh, Misha Baranov, and so on. All these people, more than 15 something years ago, said, well, you should do dipolar physics in 2D, uh, especially molecules, uh, because that's a place where you can tune the interactions and so on. It's just experiments being lagging behind. But I, I'm quoting one particular <coughs> plot from John Bone and uh, uh, Gouvan Kuminer, at the time it was John's postdoc. What they calculated on the bottom right here is a, is a picture of rate coefficient of both elastic and, and inelastic, we, they call it quenching, uh, as a function of the dipole moment. As you crank up the electrical field in the lab frame, you have induced dipole moment is increasing. And as you can see, this is the many orders of magnitude here, okay, on the, on the vertical axis. 
but you can see that you can get into a particular regime where initially your, your quenching reaction is much more dominating over el elastic reaction when the dipole moment is zero. So this is the case they calculate for KIB, which is a reactive molecule. So most of the, the dynamics you see is a, is a loss dynamics. But if you were able to turn on the electric field, you turn on the dipole moment in a controlled manner, you could get into the regime where elastic uh, interaction can be tuned by many orders of magnitude, by in their case, showing seven orders of magnitude. And while the inelastic loss can be suppressed, such that you can achieve elastic over inelastic interaction ratio by a factor of 100 or so. If you can do that, you can use this to suppress the chemical reaction I described. You can go, you can study the crossover physics from three dimensional to two dimensional uh, optical traps. You can study elastic and elastic scattering dynamics. You can use this to do direct dipole assisted evaporative cooling. And you can start, start to study collective modes like hydrodynamic regimes of molecules and so on. Maybe if not in too distant future, we can actually study pairing of these molecules between these layers. And all of these results that I'm showing you here, those five things that we, I said, we can do this, we can do this, and in fact, have been done, except the last one, which is very preliminary. So I'm going to share with you some of the results in a mere round of time. Um, the first, suppression of inelastic loss. Exactly as predicted, as those theories have predicted, as you turn up electric field, you can see the two-dimensional loss mechanism, the, the rate coefficient beta 2D starts to be suppressed by, three, by, by factor of three or four, and then turns back up. And you may ask, why did it go back up? And that's the, the problem is because the, the confinement along this direction of the bias field is not truly strong enough. You know, it, it's not, so in some ways you can say it's not a really truly 2D, it's a quasi 2D system. If you want to be truly 2D, you needed this confinement uh, length scale, the so-called harmonic length scale where the quantum mechanical wave function in the direction of the bias field, electric field in, in this vertical direction, that got to be smaller than the so-called dipolar interaction length. And only then you will be in the truly 2D regime and you will see continuous suppression as you turn up the electric field. But because we are in the quasi 2D and, and you can see initial suppression and then gets turned around. And that's just because dipole moment is so big uh, and that the, the confinement length scale in the harmonic length scale along the direction of the electric field is not small enough that two molecules can still find ways going on top of each other to have a reactive uh, loss process. So, but nevertheless, that's enough. You know, uh, with a five kilovolts per centimeter, this is where the point to divide. Remember, this theorists were predicting right around this place, you can have elastic collision cross section already increased by many orders of magnitude, where you can you can suppress this el inelastic process. And what's interesting, like this is a kind of a fun thing to demonstrate, is you can move electrical field directions. So for example, you can have the electrical field to be perpendicular to the pancake, but you can also tune this angle. As you tune the angle, you can see if the angle is a parallel to the plane, the loss is enhanced. If it's theta equals to zero degree or 90 degree perpendicular, you can see the loss gets suppressed the most. And these two different traces just showing different amount of time of holding time to see the experiment, to see the loss mechanism. So this is just showing you the angular dependence of the loss suppression. So associated with the, the, this loss suppression, it's also, we were able to suppress the anti-evaporative heating because the, you know, the molecule is no longer being lost. And it, so here the data shows the loss rate that's with respect to the vertical axis to the left as a function of the, as you crank up the vertical lattice frequency, which I mentioned um, in the previous slide, as you make the confinement stronger and stronger along the Z direction, you can see the loss, loss rate gets suppressed under a constant electrical field about two or three kilovolts per centimeter. You can see it comes down around the nine kilohertz or so, the loss rate is suppressed and it's becoming a constant. And this is the place where you can just roughly calculate, turns out to be your KBT, the, the, the temperature is less than, start to be less than H bar omega Z. Omega Z is a confinement frequency 
in the in the z direction where uh, in in this direction the, in the vertical direction where we are applying electric field and associated with that you can see the heating rate we can also measure the temperature heating rate has the same suppression and that's completely natural as as a loss is being suppressed the 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 heating associated with loss of course also gets suppressed so this you can see this very beautiful crossover from three-dimensional space into two-dimensional space here and after that, uh, that's the last part. Now let's study the elastic collision part. And one of the interesting way to study thermalization is by doing cross-dimensional thermalization. For example, we can squeeze a cloud in that transverse direction. We can squeeze a cloud, for example, along Z direction to make the, to make the uh, molecules hotter. And then the, just watch how the temperature in the X direction increases. Uh, with, and, and it here shows if the dipole moment is not so big with two kilovolts per centimeter electrical field, it takes something on the order of uh, 200, 100 something, uh, 200 millisecond time to thermalize. But as you crank up the dipole moment by going to five kilovolts per centimeter electrical field, the time scale for the to thermalize now is less than 100 milliseconds. And those are very dramatic effects you can study as a function of the electrical field. From these thermalization time scale, you can actually get, um, you know, basically calculate the collision of cross section, knowing the temperature that we already have, knowing the density in the system, and so that's allow you to plot elastic collision rate as a function of the dipole moment. And uh, as as you can see here, we are showing a two orders of magnitude enhancement of elastic collision rate. But that's because we can't really measure the elastic collision rate as it go, goes down by several orders of magnitude. Uh, unlike the theory colleagues can just calculate that with enough digit of precision on the computer code. So, so but nevertheless, this is very pleasing that we were able to get to a very high collision cross section. Uh, no, here's shown as a collision rate in our system, 100 hertz or so by the time you crank up to 0.3 Dubai. And it actually much, much more interesting, if I have time, I will show you that by the time you go to the such a large dipole moment, this cross normalization will have some something interesting uh, showing up. It's not just a thermalization process. You actually start to see uh, excitations of fundamental modes like a monopole, quadrupole modes start to come out. And that's really getting into this so-called hydrodynamic regime. But if you compare the results with the, the Gouvain and the John's uh, theory, uh, you can see indeed you know, that these symbols are experimental data on both loss and elastic collisions. And the, the two solid curves, remember, are from their paper. And it, it, except that we have the, the loss part, we actually measure something slightly lower than their, their prediction. But otherwise, this fact of 100 is well within our reach now. Um, so that gave us the confidence that we can use this to do evaporative cooling. So let's do dipole assisted evaporation then. Um, here's our electrical field. You can use it to create favorable collisions. And then how do you control the electrical field and its gradient? Well, the first thing you study is, well, let's actually study the combined effect of both the trapping field and the DC field. Combined together, they're going to modify the polarizability of these molecules. So we can understand that. We can understand the polarizability of molecules in the optical trap as a function of the DC field. Once we understand that basic uh, you know, uniform field dynamics, then we can actually start to, those are the electrodes in the middle uh, with, with, in the form of rods. We can then tune the voltage on these rods, start to, start to change the, the curvature of the, of the electrical field by applying gradient. And here shows indeed, as you're applying these um, voltages to the rods, you can actually see the trap gets deformed from where you can measure the transverse radial frequency, trap frequency to from here when the, the rod at a certain scale to somewhere where you can actually bend uh, this trap such that uh, along this direction of X where you can create the curvature uh, and, uh, and so on, you can actually start to bend the curvature such that the molecules can escape. And this is something you can, in your evaporation trajectory, you can continue to increase this, this coefficient gamma we showed in front of this voltage rod um, to con de de uh, basically to deform the, the trapping potential to allow evaporation to take place. 
Um, another interesting area that we needed to have a better control and imaging uh, is um, loading of these molecules in individual lattice. So we started these molecules in three-dimensional optical dipole trap. And we first create, you know, the ideas bottled up from so-called accordion lattice. We first create large spacing lattice with 10 micron spacing. That's just because it's easier to confine these molecules, these into a single layer of a 10 micron spacing. But then from the 10 micron spacing, we want to subdivide into 540 nanometer lattice. This is our sign, we call the science lattice, which is a, essentially ritual reflected 10, um, 1060 beam with, with a small crossing angle. That's why it's a 540 nanometer, not a 530. <coughs> so the question is, 10 microns are very easy to visualize, as you can see single pancakes in the 10 micron lattice, but a 540 nanometer lattice is more difficult unless you have a quantum gas microscope type of resolution. So what do we do is we're using a trick by using defocusing. For example, if this 540 nanometer lattice is, is actually superposed on top of the optical dipole trap, then, then initially you have the position dependence as a function of the y, you know, because these lattice is confined, the y direction is vertical, uh, and they all have the same momentum. But if you then turn off 540 nanometer lattice and let the, the crowd evolve for a quarter period of the dipole trap, then you essentially have a phase space rotation where the position information is rotated onto the momentum information. And then you just let them go from the dipole trap and image of them. And what you can see then it's individual layers. Here's seven layers, here's four layers, really showing the molecules distributed in these 540 nanometer lattices. Okay, so we have reasonable confidence now of how many molecules distributed in how many layers. Then we can go on and turn up, turn up this evaporation sequence. We can, you know, just like I showed earlier, you can increase anti-curvature, essentially decrease the trap depth of a time scale of a 500 millisecond or so, and then you then remove the trap and then image the molecules. And I want to point out one technical difficulty we have is that whenever we image molecules, we have to turn off electrical field. And so, so we actually create the molecules first and then ramp up electrical field. And when we need to image, we have to ramp down the electrical field. All these ramping takes some time on the electrical field. We are talking about charging up at this big capacitor. Um, and that's actually a technical problem uh, in, in the sense during this ramping time, we're actually losing molecules. So the actual number of molecules is actually more favorable than what I'm showing you here. We are working on techniques where eventually we'll be able to create molecules directly with electrical field turned on. In that case, that we, will can, we can bypass that 300 millisecond round the trip of electrical field ramping, and that should really create molecules in an even better experimental condition. So the create criterion for good evaporation in 2D, and as, as we know for in any dimensions, is that the loss of particles versus the loss of temperature uh, should it be the slope, should it be less than the dimensionality, and in this case, two, for two dimensions. So you can see the very common, uh, the first, uh, almost even first trial, you can see that we are well below that the two. Uh, so with a slope of one, it's telling you that phase space density is in enhancing as evaporation goes on, uh, and you're getting, moving towards a lower T of a TF in 2D. And in fact, we have carried this out over a large scale of electrical field, um, and you can see the slope of the evaporation goes down well below two, and in fact, around the place where we have the best ratio of elastic versus inelastic, about a factor of 100 or so, you can see the slope efficiency is roughly uh, uh, hovering around one. And that, that gives a pretty efficient uh, evaporation for molecules with dipole assistance. And this showing the T of TF picture that we can now, for the first time, create Fermi, uh, 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 basically Fermi gas of molecules in 2D at a temperature of T of TF about one. Uh, and I, I think actually by improving some of the technical things I pointed out, this, this temperature, we are reasonably confident as in the next few months that we will continue to improve on these numbers. But even with this, you can start to study some of the interesting, for example, collisionless to hydrodynamic transitions. Yeah, by looking at the dynamics of the 2D dipolar gas. 
the the collective interactions, uh, the the dipole dipole interaction. Once it's strong enough, comparable to the kinetic energy, when you cool the gas down, you get collective behavior, and you can, for example, study monopole mode, quadrupole mode. This is the picture on to the right showing this very beautiful quadrupole oscillations back and forth by plotting the aspect ratio of the x and y directions. And these, usually the regime from collision less to collision to hydrodynamic uh, are distinguished by measuring the frequency and damping rate of these fundamental excitation modes. And here shows some picture. In fact, Eugene Damler's group has, has uh, published early papers in 2012. They actually studied the KRB. And, and in that, in, at that time, they showed the KRB in the 2D going into quantum degeneracy. And, and you can show as you turn up the dipole moment, the, how the monopole mode, for example, increases in frequency, how the decay rate gets enhanced first and eventually decreases as you go to very large dipole moment. And so, so these are very preliminary experimental data. You can see that there's a monopole mode, for example, it's two times the fundamental trap oscillation frequency and increases as the dipole moment uh, increases and the decay rate increases. Um, and so on. So these are preliminary, but indicate, indicating that we are getting into this hydrodynamic regime. So I'm going to conclude now, telling you that I see that my time is about uh, is up. Uh, you know, we have created now strongly interacting dipolar molecule gas in 2D. We have suppressed the chemical reactions. We can tune the dominant elastic collisions by many orders of magnitude to get into a regime where the elastic dominating over inelastic by more than factor of hundred. You can use this to do evaporative cooling. You can start, use this to study collective excitations. So typical numbers, uh, I know that sometimes when we talk to theorists, they always well, give us some numbers so we can put those in the model. Okay, so it's about 200, 200 something nanocalvin, 10 to the eight. I see Andrew is smiling already. Uh, and uh, dipole moment is 0.3 divide. And we have also developed some other technical um, capabilities. For example, this is showing you an image of we can do stone gallop of, of these uh, molecules. You can create a coherent superposition between zero, zero, and one, zero state. Because we can apply these electrical field gradient, you can have this matter wave of molecules flying apart by the electrical field gradient and then recombine them and so on. So it, it would be interesting. You can also Basically, orient, uh, no, I think the early days, the dream of being able to orient molecules anywhere you wanted and have, have them coming in, collide at different orientations of the dipoles. All of this suddenly seems like it's not far-fetched that we can actually do those kind of experiments in the lab. So with that, I want to thank really the heroic effort, especially during the phase one, they did, uh, you know, Kyle and, and Will are the two graduate students. Um, Luigi, Giacomo, and Jun Lu are the two, uh, three postdocs. Um, yeah, they, they are, Luigi has the, the most incredible uh, fortune uh, or misfortune that you now he was offered a faculty position in a major research university, but then they closed down. <laughs> so, so we'll see how that, de uh, how that develops. But we have had enjoyed many theory colleagues for collaboration, uh, science, uh, is moving forward and you know, we can create a Fermi degeneracy uh, in 3D, but now we're moving into the 2D and really exciting to think about. We can actually study this intra-pancake dynamics and inter-pancake connections, strongly coupling uh, and so on. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, June, uh, for very exciting results and for a beautiful talk. Uh, we actually uh, have lots of questions and not so much time. So let, let me choose two. Um, so the first one uh, com comes from Taut Wang. Um, it's a bit long, it goes like that. So um, Taut asks if you can say more about the Zeno effect explanation for the suppressed losses. Is it that the uh, short range uh, complex losses are suppressed, are Zeno suppress, uh, the spin dephasing of the spin polarized fermionic molecules that will otherwise allow the fermions to approach at short range? And why does it start at T over TF of one and not already below the, uh, say, at, at a millikelvin? Um, the first question, the Zeno suppression. I think, uh, I, I believe Anna Maria Race Group is probably going to soon post their paper on the archive. Uh, at least they're thinking about submitting very soon. The, the basic understanding is the following, that. The Conquins group de demonstrated that when the two KRV molecules come together, you can actually 
these two molecules actually hang out with each other for a little bit, called intermediate states. And the congruence group measured the loss rate of the intermediate state. And that intermediate state can be inferenced. And John Bone has been studying so-called larger number of molecules when you have uh, you know, three and four. So, so, so it, that intermediate state molecules can potentially collide with other molecules, uh, other KRB molecules. And in hand, if the density of the other KRB molecules is larger, you can enhance that loss of the intermediate state. That's all sounds very plausible. The, the Zeno suppression comes in the, in the fact that if the intermediate state loss is actually larger than the coherent coupling regime where the two KIB molecules come together and they convert in a, through a coherent process into a KIB, K2, RB2 intermediate state. If that coherent coefficient is smaller than the loss of the intermediate state, then you can, you already, can, and, and the plus that loss is being enhanced by other molecules, other KRB molecules colliding with, it, with that intermediate state. So then uh, this, the fact that intermediate state we are going to have larger loss just because of the presence of other molecules around it would actually counterintuitively suppress that the two KRB molecules want to convert into the intermediate state to begin with. So that's the basic mechanism of the of, of Anna Maria race groups theory of where this suppression might be coming from. And, and of course, in the P wave contact theory, this is all entirely different. That's really just coming right from the many body effects. Mm -hmm. right. um, thanks. And, and now um, a bit of a in, more inspirational question maybe. Um, we have a question, um, what are the prospects of upgrading those uh, uh, kind of molecular experiments to a quantum gas microscope type uh, imaging optics such that you could achieve uh, local control and programmability maybe um, of kind of those systems with dipolar molecules? Yeah, I think that, you know, we know there are fantastic quantum gas microscope experiments now in many labs. Uh, and uh, we, what we have done is uh, we put it in a lens, which is a one micron. And that, that, that's really because of the, when we're redesigning it, we know this probably is a good thing to have a quantum gas microscope type of uh, capability in there. It's just, a, it's a lot to put together with all the electrodes uh, for the first time being introduced there. And then we have this, yeah, this, this cell that actually you, you can see in the science cover. Those cells, the walls are relatively thin. And in principle, you can measure all of the, you know, the thickness of the wall and measure the deformation of the wall under, when you pump out the vacuum, there's a, there's a pressure uh, vacuum force on it. Uh, so it deforms the glass and you can design lens system to compensate for it, to, to get to really, you know, sub-micron imaging resolution. Right now we have a micron also, 1.5 micron scale resolution, but we resign to the fact that, well, in the end, these molecules should have a relatively large interaction energy. And so you can pull them apart a little bit. This accordion lattice is one idea. Maybe we don't necessarily, uh, you, can, you can have them interact and then pull them apart and then image them. And as long as you don't have to um, pull them apart too far, uh, then, then that, that would already allow you to have capabilities of being able to image individual molecules I think this is a capability will be exceedingly important in the next phase of experiments as we get into the deep degeneracy and the, the filling fraction will be 90% or something. It would be lovely to see a three-dimensional crystal where you can encode a particular molecular spin or a line of molecular spin and watch them in a three-dimensional uh, quantum information spreading uh, through this dipolar interactions, through this full spin Hamiltonian with DC, AC, electrical field combination. So yes, I think this is a very excellent question. Uh, and uh, we, we wish, we actually been writing those papers about how do we implement quantum gas microscope capability along with all these electrical field control. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jun, um, for a beautiful talk and for sharing with us um, your recent results. And uh, for the rest of the questions, um, this we will do um, afterwards and we will share them uh, uh, through our website. So with that, um, I will pass it on to Sebastian.
Yeah, thank you very much, June, also from my side. It was a great talk and uh, lots of new cool stuff. So uh, to close out, I just want to announce that next week we will have Anne Lullier uh, speaking about photoionization using attosecond laser pulses. <clears throat> and if you want to know and get notified more about what's going on here, please go to our website, quantumscienceseminar.com and subscribe to our email list and the uh, Google Calendar. Also, please check out the uh, sisters, our sister seminar uh, hosted by our colleagues, also from Jilla, uh, and which is the AMO seminar, where tomorrow, uh, Tilman Esslinger will be talking about driven and self-driven quantum many-body systems. With this, I'd like to close out. Thank you for your interest, and we hope to see you again next week, same time, same place. Bye.